show you a case which we did a couple of days back and that's a patient which had a regional valve motion abnormality she was hypertensive there was a left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, there was a mitral regurgitation and look at the mitral regurgitation what is your impression you think that mitral regurgitation is severe all right fine let's find out whether the mitral regurgitation was severe mild or moderate one thing is very clear for an assessment of mitral regurgitation please don't depend upon color doppler only uh, that would not be actually correct because you would be miss uh, appropriately putting in a different uh, box of a mitral regurgitation being mild moderate or severe the categorization is going to be different there are more parameters which you should add in almost every patient to make an assessment that this is uh, a patient where we will learn the lesson that it looked severe but it was not and what was uh, the clue which we had and we had a pulmonary this is the lv inflow signal you see the lv inflow signal here you see the a is more than e so this e a more than e is incompatible with the severe mitral regurgitation again you have a pulmonary venous flow the sample taken from about a centimeter inside the pulmonary vein you see the d wave which is uh, prominent then the s wave again not compatible uh, with the severe mitral regurgitation why now what happens in uh, the severe mitral regurgitation once you have a regurgitation blood going right up to the pulmonary vein the la pressures increase in systole because of the large v wave that means that when you have an mr the la pressures are going to increase once the la pressures increase now the forward flow from pulmonary vein would either be obtended or would be reversed like in this patient you get a reversed pulmonary flow in the systole so that is compatible with the severe so if you have a prominent s wave that cannot happen with a severe uh, mitral regurgitation again the second point once you have a mitral regurgitation large quantity of blood is going to come through the lv inflow from la to lv because large quantity of blood went back into the la during the mitral regurgitation so now if the large blood is coming back from the the lv uh, inflow you would going to get a very large e wave so if you don't get a large e wave instead get an a more than e this again rules out practically uh, a severe mitral regurgitation so let me elaborate on these points further this is what we day and day out we all make a mistake we just do uh, color doppler jet area and la area and then we say okay fine this is the degree of mitral regurgitation we don't into take into account the other parameters today i'm going to tell you to take into account all other parameters to make an assessment of the mitral regurgitation so now the problem with the, with the mitral regurgitation if you depend upon just the jet area and la area ratio so many times it's eccentric many a times the the it depends upon the lv pressure let's say if the lv pressure is high you get a larger mitral regurgitation jet if lv pressure are small in hypotension the l uh, the mitral jet would be small so your assessment is going to be wrong dynamic mr meaning that you might have a early in light say in a patient with a mitral valve regurgitation due to mvp mitral valve prolapse what happens the regurgitation predominantly happens in the late systole early systole if you take the jet area would be small if you take the jet area in the late systole it will be large so these are the caveats it depends upon the gain setting it also depends upon the nequis limit what you have the ideal nequis limit we suggest is between 40 to 50 cm per second then you would make an assessment of a mitral regurgitation there are so many fallacies in making an assessment of mitral regurgitation that's true if you do a head on comparison of echocardiography with uh, uh, say cmr and then you realize cmr is a gold standard let me tell you that so in the mitral regurgitation now what let, let's say if there was a study where they took uh, uh, patients those who on echo was decided that this is a severe mitral regurgitation on the parameter particularly jet area or that area la area only 22% patient where we thought the mitral valve uh, regurgitation is severe turned out to be severe not only that 
30% had a mild mitral regurgitation, not even moderate. In the category which we thought this is a severe mitral regurgitation. So we need to wake up. And we thought central jet and sentry jet would make a great difference. It really doesn't make a great difference in assessment. Our accuracy is as pathetic on uh, as compared to CMR, you know, whether it's a centric jet or a central jet. So this is a wake up call. If you want to make a real assessment or a good assessment of mitral regurgitation, please follow the following tips which I'm going to share. Proximal iso uh, velocity areas and then you see this is PISA. The next thing comes is uh, vena contracta that is the narrowest portion of the jet and this forms a kind of an head and this is the neck and that the body of the jet which is the jet area and this is another method. The third method is that the uh, fourth method is that you see the pulmonary venous flow uh, uh, take into account. And another method is that you take into account the E wave uh, of the mitral inflow. Step by step, PISA. Now, in the PISA, what do you need? You need three things. You need the radius. You need the velocity Nyquist limit at which this radius appeared. You need a velocity of the regurgitation jet peak velocity in a CW. So if you have three things, you'll be able to calculate the flow across the, the regurgitation flow is 2 pi r square multiplied by velocity uh, uh, at uh, uh, the, um, the Nyquist limit and if you apply this with the peak velocity of the mitral uh, valve you'll get a, a, a ERO uh, the effective orifice uh, uh, or regurgitation area and then you can also calculate the regurgitation volume or regurgitation fraction but don't you think it's complex I also think the same in the daily practice it becomes very challenging to do it with the PISA which is kind of not uh, uniform it's not spherical it's not clearly visualized multiple issues and problem and it's a time consuming uh, process so do we have any tricks yes I'll share with you one you know this one trick is just do one thing uh, you move the baseline down that is towards the flow that's what we do we move the Nyquist limit down till you get the velocity of between uh, somewhere around 40 42 39 38 so if you get velocity around 40 and at this place you calculate the radius simple thing get it down to 40 calculate the radius and that's it and if you calculate there the radius if the radius is less than 3 then this is mild if it is more than 9 mm this is severe and it in between is is moderate that is by the PISA method easy peasy way of doing things rather than making all those uh, calculations so this is again a summary of the things what I told you just now a another add on there is a vena contractor what do we do in vena contractor vena contractor is the narrowest portion of neck of the jet correct so now vena contractor less than 3 is actually mild mild regurgitation more than 7 mm is severe and in between is moderate now vena contracta there are the problems vena contracta it's a very good method let me tell you where, where most of the time it's accurate but the issue many a times is the vena contracta is not circular you see a biplane view and you see on a 3d you see this vena contracta is is not circular now if you take vena contracta on a longitudinal axis your vena contracta would be more than on this axis it would be small correct so what we do in here we take a vena contracta area so so that would take care of uh, you know errors in the uh, diameter so if the vena contracta area is uh, less than 30 mm square then this is mild if it is uh, 75 mm square it is severe so that's another way of making an accurate assessment of vena contracta vena contracta used properly in a clinical practice probably gives you uh, uh, the very good uh, 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 assessment of the mitral regurgitation. 
Uh, and some interesting fact I'm going to share with you here. What is the interesting fact is that now this is let's say this is the blood uh, this is uh, the water flowing uh, and what is the where is the what is the area orifice this is the orifice agreed but is the where is the narrowest jet narrowest jet is not here narrowest jet is ahead and which is smaller than the actual orifice area correct so when you calculate the vena contracta area that is little smaller than the actual a orifice area and this flow dynamics also shows the same the vena contracta which is here is is smaller than the orifice area right so just keep that in mind that what vena contracta is not actually the the valve area or orifice area what you see Another good method in case you do not have a, uh, aortic regurgitation is by a continuity equation. In a continuity equation, what is our purpose? Our purpose is to find regurgitation volume and how do we do it? You would agree with me when there is a blood going back into the LA during the mitral regurgitation, the blood coming during next beat of LV inflow would contain the blood coming from the pulmonary veins and blood which has actually entered into the LA during the mitral regurgitation in the previous beat. Agreed? So now somehow if I know that what is the LV inflow then I would be able to know what is the regurgitation volume. How can I know the LV inflow? By continuity equation we know whatever blood comes inside into the LV okay goes into the aorta now if you know what blood now we can know the blood entering into the lv we know the blood going out so that means when the blood came into lv a small proportion of the blood went through the lv ot and where did the rest blood go yes the rest of the blood goes into mitral regurgitation so if you know the blood flowing from this side to the LV and going out from the LV, you would know what is the quantity of blood which went into the left atrium during mitral regurgitation. The last method of knowing the, the regurgitation uh, of uh, severity is you see the pulmonary venous flow and in this you can see the severe uh, mitral regurgitation it looks the same size as I showed you but this is entering into the pulmonary vein and look at the pulmonary venous flow which is reversed and just compare this with our case where the S wave was uh, prominent which cannot happen in patients with mitral regurgitation. Okay, so now let me summarize all. In the day to day clinical practice you guys what are you going to do? Now, <clears throat> now these are the recent uh, guidelines. Now what we do is that we take criteria for mild MR, criteria for severe MR. Now, if 4 out of this severe is present, it is severe. If 4 out of this is present, it is mild. And if there are 2 to 3 criteria on this and 2 to 3 criteria, 4 criteria are not met in either of the boxes, then it is somewhere in between, okay, where we need more information. Okay, let's see that. So if it, uh, it's more than four, let's see what are the criteria. You have a small jet. You have a vena contractor less than three. You have a PISA which is less than three in Nyquist limit of about 40 that I told you. So if the A is dominant like in our case and then if you do a CW Doppler, the intensity of inflow is more than the intensity of the TR jet. Okay, so that means the blood. This is this is another marker for uh, mild MR. And if the LV is size normal, LA size is normal, goes in favor of uh, MR mild. Now severe four, four criteria. Then now you have flyal mitral valve. If you have a flyal mitral valve where the mitral valve tip is actually going inside the LA, you don't need to put a color Doppler. This is severe MR anyway. Right? This is severe MR, so that's one criteria. Then you have a vena contracta 7 uh, millimeter or more. The PISA radius more than 9 or 1 uh, 10 mm uh, cent uh, in uh, uh, centimeter across. 
then you have a central jet which fills a very large area of the la pulmonary venous flow is uh, reversed or enlarged lv with a normal function so now this are the parameters for if four criteria are present is severe if two to three criteria are met in each box then you are somewhere in the gray zone in the middle in this gray zone you put all those calculations of continuity equation or or you do a pisa properly calculating so if you use these methods then you calculate the effective orifice area and in this category of patients then you divide them into three mild moderate and severe this should be the algorithm used in day to day clinical practice not just the color doppler of uh, uh, mitral regurgitation and that's end of the story so in case you still have doubt here you can actually resort to uh, a cmr which is the gold standard or a transesophageal echo uh, which would also help you to uh, elaborate the cause of mitral uh, regurgitation so that is in summary how you are going to assess mitral regurgitation on a day to day clinical practice these are the recent guidelines uh, by now this is what and what happened in our patient yes i tell you what happened the discrepancy that why we said uh, saw a very large uh, jet uh, area was this patient had blood pressure of 156 this she was hypertensive and she has hemoglobin less than 8 grams so both these were important now the lesson please take a blood pressure when you are doing an echocardiography and take an appropriate history in the patient so thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed it you learned and would change your day to day practice i hope so next video again i would show you some discrepancy uh, amongst the various parameters so wait for that or you subscribe and uh, maybe whenever i put the next video you would get notified as and when i do it so have a good time keep learning